Welcome to Product AMA, your daily online Ask Me Anything. We started Product AMA to give those passionate or curious about product management a daily break, something to look forward to. Our topic for today is the road to product roadmaps. And driving us on that road, we have Dennis Chow, who is a well-known product leader in the Toronto product management community and has led a variety of different products at different organizations like Intuit and Telus. I've known Dennis for quite some time and I love how he approaches product roadmaps. Thank you, Dennis, for joining us today. Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and tell us what are you up to these days? Yeah, sure thing, Rhythm. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, basically, you know, sort of, uh, I've, been a, I've been in the product space for about uh, 15 years now. Um, you know, sort of, I started out, um, I think like a lot of uh, folks who've been around for a while, um, I started out in this space before, sort of, it was, you know, the formal product management that, that sort of all of us, you know, have grown to know and love. Um, I was uh, heavily influenced early on in my career by um, Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, The Outliers, and, uh, you know, sort of his notion of uh, 10,000 hours, and, um, you know, sort of trying to, um, you know, think about uh, what you're achieving uh, over 10,000 hours. So I, I, I took that to heart and I tried to map out my, uh, <laughs> I tried to map out my product career in uh, 10,000 hour chunks. And so, um, you know, I did some quick math, thought, you know, uh, 40 hour work weeks, uh, there's, you know, 52 weeks a year, you know, I really only take two weeks off anyway. So call it 50 working weeks a year, that's 2000 hours. You know, can you can you hammer away at something for five years in order to get the, to the ten thousand hours? And that's what I tried to do, you know, over the over the course of my career thus far. I'd argue that you know the first five years, uh, the first ten thousand hours was really spent trying to figure out how to be a good product manager, right? That was years one through five. Years six through ten, um, you know, sort of making that leap into um, leadership in product. So going from managing a product to managing product managers who manage a product. Um, you know, and then, and then sort of really learning and, and trying to accrue uh, 10,000 hours towards that. And then sort of, you know, these last, uh, you know, sort of five years, years um, 11 through uh, 15 have largely been around, you know, sort of what does it mean when, you know, sort of you, you run a product department at the highest level and, you know, you sit on a senior leadership team at an organization and, you know, you've got those new dynamics in terms of the pushes and the pulls, you know, that you have with your colleagues, your, your the other VPs of the other departments, um, as you're all trying to align towards, you know, sort of the betterment of the organization that you happen to be a part of. Uh, that's, that's largely how I, you know, look to describe sort of the product career that I've had. Awesome. Awesome. That's, that's an amazing journey that you have had. And like, uh, I've known I've known so many product leaders, and like everyone has their unique story, and uh, even you have like uh, you know a unique path that you take took in your product management career. All right, Dennis, I would like to start off the AMA by asking you, why should product managers build a roadmap? Why can't they just have a backlog of all the items they want to execute? Why do we even need a roadmap, and what are the objectives of a roadmap? Great question, Rhythm. Um, I think. You know, in order to answer that, um, you've, we've got we've got to agree on sort of what it is that you know a product manager or a product management team is largely responsible for. And you know, I think there's a couple of things that come to my mind. Um, you know, product management really is responsible for um, defining what, and then you know, sort of evangelizing and articulating the, the why. Right. So this notion of you know what do we choose to do next as an organization by way of, you know, how we go about solving for, um, you know, problems and pain points, right? There's, there's, you know, ar there's arguably a whole bunch of different opportunities, a bunch of different options in front of, you know, sort of the, the, the organization in terms of which paths to pursue. I think it's the, the role of product to really evaluate all of those options and then determine sort of, you know, which one would be the best course of action given sort of the immediate objectives of the, of, the, of the organization in front of them. It's this notion of defining the what and then going and justifying that through really articulating the why. I think, you know, product management works really tightly with uh, design and with engineering to determine um, how and when, but the notions of the what and the why, I would argue, are fairly exclusive within the domain of, of your PS. 
So if you agree to that, then sort of, you know, you also want to um, imagine, if you will, uh, this Venn diagram, uh, you know, think about three circles and, and, and really trying to always, you know, think about as a product person, how you can sit at the intersection or how you can make sure that the work that you're doing is, is, is at the intersection of those three circles. Um, on the one side, you've got, you know, sort of customer and user problems and pain points, right? That's one circle. The other circle, you've got um, business objectives, right? The, the objectives that your organization is looking to accomplish. And then finally, you know, that third circle is the, you know, sort of the technical constraints that, you know, sort of you may be facing um, as, as, as a technology group, as, as, a, as a product and, and, and development uh, arm, if you will. Um, I think, you know, good product people are always looking at, you know, how they can find themselves um, really looking to prioritize things that really sit at the intersection of solving for customer pain points and, and, and user needs, um, at the same time, meeting business objectives all within, you know, the technological constraints that, that, that you know, the organization finds themselves in. Now, that being said, um, you know, sort of your roadmaps could be a reflection of, you know, each of those three things at some point or another, right? There, there are times where, um, you know, sort of you're looking at um, enhancing what is already existing because, you know, your users are demanding that. There are other times where you may be looking to venture out into new uncharted territory because, you know, there's a business objective to, uh, and a desire for expansion, right? Maybe, maybe a pursuit into new markets. Um, and then finally, you know, sort of, I think something that hits near and dear to all of us in product you know, you're always trying to contend with, you know, your engineers who, um, you know, are never satisfied with, you know, sort of the, uh, the, the sustainability of the code base and how, you know, sort of at any given moment, we're sitting on a fragile house of cards and it's all going to come tumbling down. And, you know, if, if you give them sort of the keys to the kingdom, they'd want to refactor everything, replatform it uh, and, and just make it stronger and better. Um, all three, all three options are, are, are valuable. All three options hold merit with them. And, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the job of a product manager and in turn, the output that a product manager produces, namely that of a roadmap, really looks to um, articulate sort of what that looks like. Um, you know, to put it in another way, um, you know, the strategy of, of, a, of a product team is, is really, you know, sort of a, a, a defined statement that says, you know, this is the mission, this is the vision of the organization. And this is what we're going to do to realize that from a product standpoint. These are the things that we're going to do. I think like a really good, any, like, like any good strategy, you're going to talk about what you are going to do, but you're also going to talk about what you're not going to do, right? Um, I think, you know, good product people are, are, are really involved and immersed in strategy. I think at the same time, they're also really immersed in tactics, right? And this is where some organizations might, might refer to the notion of product owners who sit with you know, their, 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 their dev squads, right, alongside their, their developers and their QA folks. Um, but it's really the tactics that you're employing to bring, you know, features and functionality to market. Um, to me, a roadmap is simply where the rubber hits the road rhythm. I think, I think the notion of the roadmap is one in which you're saying, look, here's the strategy. Here's the endpoint. Here's the destination. Here's where we want to go. Here's where we are today. The roadmap simply shows how you get from here to there, right? Interesting, like uh, you know, connecting connecting the product features to the overall strategy. That's an interesting point. Uh, moving ahead, uh, Dennis, having dealt with, dealt with so many roadmaps across your career, what is your definition of an effective roadmap? Oh. Um... I think uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a summary statement of sort of the long-winded answer I gave you earlier. I think an effective roadmap um, will showcase uh, the next set of initiatives that um, a technology group, a product and engineering department, will look to embark upon that either solve for customer problems, meet business objectives, or do both within the existing technical constraints, or they may also expand upon existing technical constraints, right? I think there's going to be um, a, a mix of, of, of all three of those things. Um, a roadmap, um, an effective roadmap will showcase 
um, you know, the defined set of initiatives that speak to that, but then also will be able to um, convey to the audience, uh, the people who are looking at that roadmap, um, why those things make sense um, at that point in time. Great. And to our audience, as a reminder, <laughs> please ask your questions for, uh, to Dennis in the chat and I'll be picking them up very soon. So Dennis, when a product team is thinking about building a product roadmap, what should be a, the good, what should, what's, a, what's a good starting point for them? What all sources of data and stakeholder teams play a <clears throat> huge role in influencing a roadmap? Yeah, great question, great question. Um, inputs uh, or, or, or um, pieces of information that go into um, consideration for the development of a roadmap. Um, I think you've got, you know, two primary streams, right? You've got um, qualitative uh, inputs and then you've got quantitative inputs. Now, with respect to the qualitative inputs, um, you know, there's the notion of, um, you know, several things really. It's, 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 you know, understanding where your product, where your organization sits within the market, having, having an eye towards, not having all your eyes, but just one, you know, an eye towards the market and the competition and understanding sort of your relative standing and, and, you know, sort of really looking to justify, you know, do you want to be ahead? Do you want to be at par? Do you want to be a little behind? You know, what's, what's, your, what's your approach in terms of your market position there? So having an eye towards the competition and understanding what your competitors are doing and, and making sure that you're responding in kind. Uh, I think that's, that's one uh, piece of qualitative input. I think another one is, um, you know, really understanding, um, you know, sort of the, uh, the, the objectives of the leadership team. In, in the organization, understanding, um, you know, sort of at that current point in time within that fiscal year, um, you know, do certain um, co company objectives matter more than others, right? Um, you know, sort of if 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 you know, sort of you're in Q4 and you're you're or you're you're in Q3 and you're preparing for Q4, um, you know, a conversation with your leadership team doesn't hurt, and you know, sort of perhaps you know, amongst the myriad of company objectives that, that, that exist, maybe customer retention seems to be the big thing that is on the mind of your, your leadership team in, in that fourth quarter. Um, you know, how do you look to take that in, into consideration as you look to, you know, sort of evaluate opportunities against each other, right? So I think that's another avenue. Um, I think, you know, you, you'd be foolish to ignore your colleagues in engineering to understand, again, right, the technical constraints, understand sort of, you know, what's going to break, what's, re what's legitimately going to break at any given moment, you know, how much tech debt do you need to pay down, right, what kind of refactoring uh, do you need to take into consideration and what needs to be prioritized there. And then finally, with respect to the qualitative piece, I think it's, you know, the whole VOC, right, the notion of the voice of the customer and, and you know, how much feedback can you get by way of, you know, sort of hearing directly from customers and users. And, and, and with respect to that, I think, you know, you've got three key areas that you want to look at, right? I think you're, you're looking at, um, you know, your sales team and, and, and really looking at dialing in with them and understanding, you know, sort of the, the folks in sales who speak to prospects, to speak, who speak to people who are evaluating your product and your company on a regular basis, um, what, do they, what do they care about? What matters to them, right? Why did they say yes to choosing your company and your product? Um, you know, who did they say no to when they said yes to you? Why did they say yes to you? Why did they say no to them? And then, you know, sort of, you know, what's more interesting for me, um, the, the flip side to that, right? C customers who said no to you. Why did they say no, right? Who did they say yes to? Who were you evaluated against? Um, you know, why did they say yes to that other company and their product? Why did they say no to you? Um, compiling that feedback to really get an understanding of what matters to um, soon to be or prospective uh, customers. Um, the, the, the flip side of that coin, I think, is um, really, you know, having a regular sync up with your customer success teams. Uh, these, these are the folks in your organization who are speaking to your existing customers, right? And these are the folks who, you know, sort of really are the first point of contact for customers and users who, um, you know, now that the, the, the initial glow of the sales call is over, now that implementation is done and, and, and they're actually using the product or the service, um, perhaps things aren't working out quite as they had anticipated. Perhaps things are not working out as designed. 
right? Um, maybe that particular configuration that the customer is, is using um, just doesn't flow well, given sort of the, 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 their normal flow of work. And so these notions of obviously bugs, but then also defects, right? Things that, you know, from a, from a code standpoint, it, it looks fine, but it just, from a workflow standpoint, it just doesn't feel right, right? Like these notions of defects and bugs, um, these are things that customers call into customer success teams and really let them know. So I think it's important for product folks to really have a regular beat on that and, and, and to have a regular connection to customer success in order to understand sort of the needs and the desires of existing paying customers, right? Not just soon to be customers. So I think there's that piece. And then finally with them, you know, from the qualitative side, the last, you know, sort of cohort, the last group, I think good product people should be talking to um, are customers and users themselves, right? There's this, you know, sort of, um, there's this uh, acronym out there called Mejito, right? Nothing important happens in the office. Um, I'm a firm believer of that. I think, you know, as a product person, you got to get out there. You got to be talking to your customers and users yourself. Um, you know, like, you know, that you, you use your sales and your customer support success teams um, to, to help you get um, mass behind, you know, opinions and sentiment and feedback. But, um, you know, you can't rely solely on that. You got to get out there yourself and you got to walk and you got to sort of have conversations. You got to observe, you know, how people are interacting with your product. I would say, you know, all of that speaks to the qualitative feedback and, and, and inputs that, you know, a product manager should be taking into consideration when they're looking at sort of, you know, what do we look in, you know, what might influence a roadmap. On the, quantity, on the quantitative side with them, I think you've got, you know, sort of just basic ideas around, um, you know, data and analytics, right? I think, um, you know, sort of more and more, you know, companies are, are, are quite sophisticated in, in, in data analytics these days. I think, uh, you know, sort of this is now becoming more and more sort of just um, table stakes right from the get-go to understand and to capture, you know, sort of all the different types of user activities and user actions by way in which your customers and users are interacting with your product to capture all of those events and actions and to store them in a database and then to be able to link things together to find out, hey, you know, where is this usage workflow dropping off? Is there an abandonment rate here? You know, what does that look like? I think, you know, sort of, you know, uh, usage and transactional databases in-house are, 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 you know, sort of valuable to really understand how customers are using your product. I think there's a lot of, uh, at the same time, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, great software out there that, you know, sort of essentially sits uh, on top of, of, you know, your software or your application, um, you know, th companies that come to mind, things like uh, companies like Pendo or Amplitude, um, you know, sort of uh, WalkMe and Heap. These are all companies that I think of that, you know, sort of either add a contextual layer um, you know, on top of your application to help you really understand more deeply, um, you know, sort of what it is that your customers and users are doing, right? I think all of those companies that I mentioned, um, you know, I would argue their target market are the product people within a given organization. For sure. And great points. Like I really uh, like the notion of getting, having uh, empowered product teams where engineers are contributing as well and like challenging your ideas or either, su either supporting your ideas. And like customer success, for sure, like those are the frontline employees and chatting with the customers more closely. And that's why we see a lot of great product managers coming from the customer success teams these days. All right. So I see a couple of questions in the chat for you, Dennis. And uh, yeah. these are regarding feedback and talking to customers. So Alicia is asking about, you know, the top three questions that uh, you ask your customers. Great question. Um, I'm going to cheat on that. <laughs> I'm going to cheat on that question with my answer. Um, there's, there's really sort of two key things. That, that really come out to mind. There are three things I want to do, um, but there are two key questions that I find myself asking um, in terms of um, making sure universally, right? I wanna get the, the sentiment, the feedback back from any customer I visit. Obviously, you know, sort of that unique customer at that unique visit, um, you know, there will be a whole series of other questions that arise and the discussion will sort of, you know, tangentially move off into different directions. That's fine. But, um, you know, the two questions to answer Alicia's, you know, sort of inquiry. Uh, the first one is, uh, what's working? You know, what's working? What do you like? 
you know, what's, what's, you know, how does this product make your work life easier? How are we helping you, um, you know, in executing, you know, your day to day, right? Like, show me that, show me what that looks like. And I think it's really good for product people to get that reinforcement time and time again, like out in the wild, right? To see your product in the wild actually being used and to see, you know, firsthand with your own eyes, the benefit, the value that your product brings to other people. Um, that's, that's a really, that's a really good confidence booster. I think it's a really good sort of just refresher to have on a regular basis. So I think, I think that's the first question you want to understand. Um, obviously that kind of feedback absolutely goes back and, and helps your, your marketing teams and your product marketing teams in, in really, you know, sort of, um, you know, reinforcing, you know, value propositions, if you will. Right. So that's the first question. The second question is, is the flip side to that. And that's sort of what's not working, right? What, what are you finding, um, you know, you thought would be okay, but it's not, it's actually not okay. Right. Similar to sort of some of the inquiries that, you know, um, push uh, customers and users to call into customer success with, you know, sort of just uh, pieces of feedback around, Hey, you know what, this workflow is kind of janky. It doesn't really work that way. Right. Um, really want to understand what that looks like, right. Or, uh, around sort of, Hey, um, you know, you, you, you were told in the sales call, uh, it was going to work like this, you know, sort of the, the onboarding, the demos, the, the, the training that you were provided by our customer success team. Again, it was, it was supposed to work like this, you know, sort of what's not working for you, right? What, what are you finding? Hey, you know, it sounded okay, but now that I'm actually in it, now that I'm actually doing it, mm, maybe it's not right. I think that's, that's the second question I look to find. Um, uh, maybe the third question I look at, um, you know, if there is a third question, um, you build a product, you build a service to solve for a problem or to solve for a set of problems for a target audience, for a target market. Um, you know, with respect to thinking about expansion, thinking about uh, evolution um, of your product, of your product suite, of your services that you offer, you know, does it make sense to throw out the question when you're doing customer visits every now and then, you know, are there adjacent problem sets that a customer has that make, you know, sort of natural sense for sort of you and your company to, to see what you might do to tackle, right? Are there sort of literally, you know, sort of arm's length problems, you know, you, 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 your product covers this, but there's a whole other set of problems literally right beside sort of these sets of problems. Is it not that much of a lift for you and your organization to try to tackle those, again, to try to solve for customer needs? So I think about maybe, you know, sort of finding ways to uncover adjacent or, or, or neighboring problem sets that customers and users might have. Um, the other key thing I'd, I'd wanna say um, for Alicia is, um, as much as you're asking questions, I think another really key thing to do when you're doing customer visits is, um, to spend a, a fair bit of time um, just observing, right? Uh, there should be a point in a customer visit where you're not talking and they're not talking and you literally just get a chance to watch them using your product. I think there's a, there's a huge, huge learning that, that opportunity in that because I think what you'll come to find is, um, you know, the instruction manual right? Like the best practices that, you know, your customer success team are advising on, on the onboarding and training calls say, Hey, this product was built. Um, and the way in which to engage with this product is to follow in the according sequence of A, B, C, and D, right? And, and that's how you should do it. And, and, you know, sort of, um, the, the customer or the user may tell you, Hey, uh, you know, you tell me it's like this, but no, it doesn't work for me, for my business. It doesn't work for my setting, you know, for my unique circumstances. I actually need to go B, A, C, D, right? And then, you know, you'll hear them say that and you're like, okay, that's great. You'll take down those notes. Uh, but then when you watch them, um, you'll actually discover they're going D, C, B, A, right? They're going in a completely different order in which they're even telling you, right? Um, very, very much so. Customers and users will tell you one thing, but they will do something else entirely different. And I think it is absolutely key for product people when you're doing customer visits to have time, to allocate time in that visit for silent observation in order to uncover those discrepancies. It's not to uncover and then to like put it in their face to be like, hey, you told me this, but it's actually that. It's to take note and to say, okay, that's fine. Maybe you think it's this way, but this is what your actions are actually saying. 
Awesome. Well, that's a, that's a great point about ob- observation because uh, obser- observing u- users using your product can help you understand how your user experiences and how can you improve it. Because as you rightly mentioned, what people say and what people do are completely different things. Mm-hmm. All right. We have another question from Harman here who's asking, what percentage of features do you reserve for discovery when you are working on your product roadmap? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I don't think, um, I don't think there's a hard percentage to be, to be perfectly honest with you. Right. I think, um, you know, sort of, uh, I'll, I'll draw back to sort of the notion of trying to find that right balance of solving, you know, sort of customer needs and, and also meeting business objectives. I think, you know, the bullseye, the sweet spot is when, you know, the, the ability to solve a customer need need at, is at the same time, you know, the, uh, the achievement of a particular business objective, right? When they're two in one, I think that's fantastic. And, and absolutely, you go for that. Um, you know, there may be times when um, it, it may not be, right? There may be times where um, the business objective, uh, you know, may make sense for the organization, but um, there, there's no uh, pre-existing or pre, uh, um, uh, there's no already known uh, customer problem. To, to solve in order to meet the, the business objective. I think that's where sort of you, you've got the opportunity to, to do a bit of discovery, right? Um, discovery around sort of, hey, what new problems, what new opportunities uh, might exist? Um, I think if you can tie that back to sort of meeting business objectives, I, I think you're, you're, you're gonna stand a greater chance of being uh, able to justify why you need to do those discovery pieces. Um, you know, sort of elements of discovery can also um, you know, arise when you're looking at um, validating customer problems, right? The notion of customer problem validation, you hear it from one or two or five or 20 customers. That doesn't matter when your customer base is in the hundreds of thousands, right? So, you know, how, how do you have that opportunity to validate, you know, sort of the feedback that you're getting in, in sort of drips and drabs uh, against the aggregate as a whole? How do you have that opportunity to validate that? I think sort of that's where, again, right, opportunities for, for discovery happen, um, uh, you know, arise and, and present themselves. Um, I, 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 I may be dancing around the question, um, and I'll try to answer it directly. Um, I think it depends. And I think it depends on the context of the organization that you find yourself in. Um, and I think it depends on the needs of the, of the organization, the needs of the customers, right? What matters? Are you in um, you know, a state. Um, also, I think you know what also takes it. What what's also should be taken into consideration is uh, the relative maturity or infancy of your product that you're working on. Right? Is it a brand new thing? And you know, sort of, it's it's you know, sort of really on the on the forefront of innovation and doing things in ways that nobody's ever thought of or conceived of. Or is it you know, sort of you know, this is something tried, tested, and true. It's a very mature product, and, and we know, you know, we know, you know, sort of most of the problem sets and, and how it solves for that. I think the, the desire for discovery and, and, you know, in turn, the corresponding mix, the balance that you're going to need to, to make in terms of having a roadmap that is, you know, sort of some part discovery, some part delivery, um, hugely dependent on all of those factors that I just mentioned. Awesome. Yeah, like really like the point about spending less time on proven concepts and more on maybe, you know, innovative things that you want to do with your product. Awesome. So to the audience, feel free to ask more questions to Dennis directly in the Zoom chat. I'll pick them up. Uh, Dennis, when one is ref, uh, referring to so many data source uh, data sources and taking feedback from an array of stakeholders, a variety of opportunities might emerge from the analysis that need to be on the product roadmap. Can you tell us how can we effectively evaluate and prioritize these opportunities? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, there's, um, there's a ton of resources available out there and it doesn't take much, um, it doesn't take much searching online to find um, a whole different, uh, a whole plethora of uh, different prioritization techniques, right? Um, just in, in my own career, at various points in time, I've used, um, you know, sort of the rice model, right? Um, you know, sort of the the reach, the impact, the confidence, and and, and the, the the effort. Um, I've used uh, Moscow, 
um, you know, must do, should do, could do, would do. Um, you know, I've evaluated opportunities, you know, effort versus value. Um, I've plotted them against a Kano chart. Um, you know, I've sat down with finance and we've built out sort of, you know, detailed financial models on, you know, what kind of, you know, revenue generation or cost savings we might anticipate from the development of certain features. Um, you know, all the way through to, you know, engaging in, you know, sort of fun innovation games where, you know, you, 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 you ask your stakeholders to, you know, play the role of product manager and, you know, you'll do something like buy a feature where, you know, you give everybody an envelope of cash and, you know, sort of you lay out all the features and their associated costs, and then you get them to play, you know, to put their money down. Uh, we've done weighted average scorecards to, to effectively evaluate, you know, sort of seemingly disparate things in, in, in some comparative way. Um, I think the point I'm trying to make with them, um, you know, I've done all of those things. I, I have no sort of, um, you know, silver bullet. There's no magic bullet that says this one method is the best way to do it. Um, product as a, as, a, as a practice with them is, is a highly variable practice that's dependent upon the context that the organization itself is in. Um, my encouragement to product folks is to be willing to try different methods of prioritization out and to see which one works for you and your product team and your organization by way of the support that you're gonna get and the reception that you're gonna have from the final output, right? Um, you know, for, for, for one particular roadmap, try to prioritize it using RICE. Try to prioritize it using Moscow. Maybe for a different one, engage your stakeholders and have them go through a buy a feature uh, innovation game. Um, but try, thing, try different things out. I think, you know, sort of, it, it, you're, you're, you're gonna get inevitably a different res, uh, response and, and, and a different reception um, to the roadmaps based on the different ways in which you've prioritized. At the end of the day, rhythm, I think, as a product person, you know, you've, you have a story to tell, right? What methods you select that will showcase the work that you and your team did and, and what you guys put into in order to come up with the selection of the problem, the right problems to solve that, that you know, sort of, again, that's going to be variable. Um, it's all going to be in, you know, sort of how you convey the story. And, and that story is, you know, the one of the roadmap where it's, hey, you know, we know that this is the end point. This is where we are. This is how we're going to get there. Here's the here's the methods. Here's the vehicles we're going to use along the journey in order to get to the endpoint. Awesome. And talking about stakeholders, Lee is asking a question here: that how do you manage a CEO, a founder, or an exec who is introducing urgent changes for revenue opportunities that completely derails the roadmap? <laughs> Oh, because that's never happened to anybody, right? <laughs> um, purely fictitious uh, question, Lee. I appreciate it. Um, no, I think, you know, joking aside, Rhythm, what, what I would say is, um, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, perhaps, um, you know, a bit of a sucker for, for, for authority um, and, and respecting sort of the chain of command. I think, you know, there's a way in which you can be respectful in terms of, um, you know, sort of really calling into question whether, you know, sort of the idea of the day is, is the right thing to pursue at, at that point in time. I think, um, you know, sort of, as I mentioned, right, um, articulating a good strategy is talking about all the things that you're going to do, but also talking about the things that you're not going to do. I think to parallel that, you know, sort of handling a CEO or a founder or executive who comes in with sort of a seemingly impulsive ask to say, oh, I've got this new deal or I've got this one thing and, and, and we need to do this because, you know, sort of we're going to land that if, if we do it. And this seemingly coming out of left field, I think, um, you know, sort of it's incumbent upon product teams to be able to um, very calmly and methodically lay out, you know, hey, look, um, Let's just make sure that this is, you know, the best move for the organization. If we can clearly and, and objectively state that pursuing this new thing that has come in is the right thing, it meets the right goals, right? It's, it's, it's you know, sort of, again, at the intersection of that, of that, you know, three-circle Venn diagram, right? Like it's solving for customer problems, it's achieving business objectives all within the technological constraints that we face as an organization. If it does that better than any of the things that we're doing right now, okay, you know, maybe that is the right thing to do. I think it's important to also showcase, look, by injecting this new initiative, you're now pushing all of these other things further out. 
you're now saying goodbye to all of these other things. All of the planning that we did, all the preparations that were put in place are now shoved off to the side to accommodate for this new thing. Are we sure that this is the best course of action? I think, you know, sort of this is where I would suggest, you know, a, 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 an effective skill, a good skill for a product person to have is to be sort of really that um, level-headed uh, facilitator and moderator in these types of discussions, right? I think you want to be able to say, look, um, you know, I'm not passionate. I'm not, I'm not uh, leaning or particular towards one initiative over the other. I just want to do, you know, sort of the best thing for our uh, the business and the best thing for our customers and users. Um, let's just make sure that, you know, sort of the thing that we're, we're evaluating is in fact the best thing. So th this notion of, you know, sort of, if you can have that, you know, sort of measured approach and the, methodol the, the methodology that you employ around sort of saying, look, we do this, let's really understand the value. And let's really all agree this value is greater than the value of the things that we've already said we were going to commit to. So now we are going to not, no longer commit to those previous things. We're going to commit to this thing. By virtue of that, also, we're throwing away this other work. You know, sort of all this preparation is now to the wayside. Um, we are all okay with that. Do we all agree? I think, you know, sort of it's, I would, I would push the product person in that situation to be able to um, have the conviction to have that type of moderated discussion to get that consensus. Awesome. And we have another question here related to the outcomes related to product roadmaps. How do you classify what outcomes would, uh, you know, uh, be counted as wins in your roadmap and how can one get better at developing that skill? Okay. Um, rhythm, I would say uh, if you have an item in your roadmap that isn't a win, I'd seriously question how that thing got in the roadmap. Um, as I had previously described, um, you know, product people um, receive inputs from a whole array of different uh, sources. Um, everybody's got a wish list, right? And, and, you know, sort of you're going to pick and choose from people's wish lists. Um, any item on a roadmap should be somebody's win, right? For it to be nobody's win, I seriously call into question why that would be in there in the first place right? You're going to have, you know, a sponsor, you're going to have somebody who requested that, it, you know, that particular item, whether it be, you know, somebody internally in the organization, or whether it be the customer themselves, right? Somebody requested it, right? It, it makes sense to somebody, like, you know, sort of any item in the roadmap should have, you know, sort of should be somebody else's win, right? So, so I would say, you know, sort of it's, it's maybe, you know, sort of that's a, that's a, you know, an aggressive reaction to that question. But I would argue, um, yeah, like, you know, every single item that you place in a roadmap uh, needs to come from, you know, some sort of desire from somebody and, and, you know, sort of fulfilling that desire should classify as a win. Awesome. So audience, keep the questions coming. We have some more time with Dennis right here. And Dennis, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk to you about the timelines of a roadmap. So product roadmaps are defined for a particular time period, but product managers are consistently collecting feedback from their customers and other stakeholders and teams. So how should they go about updating and evolving the roadmap and how often should it be updated and how long should it span for? I think um, rhythm, you know, sort of what's in my mind around that um, there are tactical roadmaps and there are strategic roadmaps, right? I think the tactical roadmaps are naturally um, uh, more near to shorter term, whereas your strategic roadmaps are, um, you know, correspondingly naturally longer uh, term. Um, you know, just take this, take the word roadmap rhythm and, 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 and appreciate it for what it literally is, right? Um, you are seeing down a road. Um, just think about when you look down a road. Items that are closer are more well-defined, right? They're, they're, there's, there's you know, sort of greater detail you can make out. Items that are further out 
are a little more blurry. They're a little more fun. You, you may not make out all the specific details. If we're calling these things roadmaps, why are we not applying the same principles that occur in real life, right? The further something out is, how on earth are you going to be able to say with any degree of confidence how specific and concrete you're going, like, how are you able to, how are you even able uh, to do that, right? That's what I would argue. So this notion of, you know, sort of the further out the timeline of your roadmap, um, two things, um, the less the resolution and also the less the confidence, right? The closer the timeline, the greater the resolution in terms of, um, you know, the details, right? Just, you know, how sharp the image is and, 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 you know, how concrete and specific you are. And also, the greater the degree of confidence you should have as a product person in achieving the delivery of, of, of said items, right? So this is where I would say, you know, sort of if you recognize that, right? Sort of uh, objects that are closer to you uh, in distance, um, you know, you should be able to make up more clearly than objects that are further away, um, you know, sort of, but, you know, objects that are further away, you still want to have an eye towards because you want to know where you want to go. I mean, that right there should dictate, you know, your tactical roadmap in terms of what you're going to be doing, you know, the functionality you're going to be releasing in the next, you know, sort of defined time period versus your more strategic roadmap that speaks to sort of more higher order um, broader strategic problems that you're going to seek to really unpack or look to solve for in some way, shape, or form. Um, that's 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 how I would argue. You know, sort of folks, you know, in product should attempt to take a look at, you know, how to balance, you know, sort of near term and long term uh, uh, roadmaps. Right. Um, anybody who presents a roadmap to me that says, you know, this is a two year roadmap, and by Q4 of year two, we are going to release this feature. Uh, I'm just, you know. I, I'm convinced they, they, you know, they're out to lunch, right? There's no way you're going to be able to predict that. Um, so many things change. So many things change in the course of, you know, a, a month, let alone the course of 24 months, right? So how do you have with any degree of certainty, especially, and I say this principle applies even more so in sort of what I find, you know, sort of we see a lot of in, in the tech space, these rapidly scaling, rapidly growing organizations, right? Um, two years ago, you know, the, or, or from, from, from present day, if you find yourself in one of these situations, you know, you've got a technology group, you've got a product and engineering department of maybe 20 people. Two years from now, it could be 200 people, right? How on earth are you going to be able to say with any degree of confidence that you're going to deliver on Feature X, you know, when, when squads are going to change, when people are going to change, right? When, when mandates may change. So again, right, sticking, you know, the further out you go, to more broader strategic goals, and then sort of the closer in you are, the more near term you are, um, really articulating on sort of, you know, the tactical delivery of features and functionality. That's what I would advocate for. That's what I would encourage product people to look at. Um, in terms of, you know, sort of, um, you know, how many roadmaps or, or, or how often they need to be updated, I would say, um, you know, if you can have, uh, if you can find yourself getting to a rhythm where you've got, um, you know, a quarterly roadmap, you've maybe got sort of a 12 to 18 month roadmap and then sort of your, your longest term, you know, sort of um, again, and even this is up for debate, right? But if you can articulate something, you know, within a three year time frame or a five year time frame, that might be um, sort of good, right? So, you know, three different levels or three different, you know, sort of time spans, um, you know, what you might want to look at. I'd argue for the last one rhythm, um, the longest, the farthest you want to go out as a product organization in terms of producing roadmaps for the rest of the organization um, should correspond to how far out your company's strategic plan is. So if you're in an organization that has a three-year strategic plan and they're asking you to create a five-year roadmap, I think you're well within your grounds to say, hang on a second, <laughs> something doesn't feel right here, right? But if you've got a three-year plan as an organization and they're asking you for a three-year roadmap, I think that's inbounds. I think that's, that's totally on site. Awesome. I'm glad you mentioned about, you know, changing dynamics in the tech space, because that's what my next question is about. That in the current health crisis we are living in, where businesses have been impacted either positively or negatively, the existing roadmaps might have been shaken and things might have turned uh, chaotic. So how should product teams react to such an unexpected situation and pivot their roadmaps? 
Yeah, great question. Great question. Um, look, the current context we're in rhythm, um, there's just, there's still too much uncertainty. There's too much unknown. I think we are only now, um, as you know, society in general, I think we're only now starting to be able to look at, you know, beyond next week, potentially into next month. Um, whereas I would argue, you know, several weeks ago, um, or even last month, it was very hard to try to predict, you know, what next week was going to look like. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, you, you, you've, you've probably been exposed to the same news articles I have, very, you know, the, the, the situation of this pandemic is, you know, was very fluid in terms of a day to day basis. Um, recognizing that and yet asking a product team within a company to still commit to and articulate on a longer term roadmap. Um, that's just absolute, you know, not only is it an impossibility, but it's verging on nonsense in my mind. Right. I think sort of, you know, you've got to be not shy as a product person in this day and age, in this current context with everything going on around this pandemic. I think you cannot be shy in sharing to your stakeholder groups, you know, what you don't know. And, um, you know, sort of uh, subsequently, you know, the things that you won't be tackling because you don't know. Right. Um, again, right. Going back, I sound like a broken record now. This is now my third time saying this. What's a good strategy? A good strategy says what you're going to do. A good strategy says what you're not going to do. I think, you know, in this per current point in time, it's important to say, hey, look, these are the known things. These are the unknown things. This is what we're going to continue to work on and iterate on based on what we know. These are the things that we don't know. I don't think it hurts to sh share a plan that says as the unknown becomes known, will look to pivot and iterate accordingly. And when we do have those changes, you, Mr. or Madam Stakeholder, will be informed accordingly. I don't think that hurts at all. But um, I don't think it's a shame to be able to say, there's still so much in flux, there's still so many variables that can change in front of us, we should stick with what we know. That being said, Rhythm, uh, perhaps a, 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 a mechanism that might help folks out there, um, if it's very easy to, to look up as well, I'm a big fan of McKinsey's three horizons model, right? So um, picture, if you will, you know, sort of a chart, um, you know, sort of your Y axis is, is, you know, sort of value, your X axis is, is time, and you've got these sort of three curves, right? And the curves are really sort of the horizons. You know, horizon one, right, in the, in the bottom left of, of, of the graph there, right, near term, um, you know, perceived lower value, right, because it's in the near term. Um, really, you know, sort of these initiatives that fall within horizon one rhythm, um, you know, you can really, do, um, uh, it's, it's uh, the definition of them are really to defend and expand the current core business, right? Uh, just focused on current core business, current uh, core capabilities. Uh, you've got horizon two, right? Um, you know, sort of mid, a little bit longer term, uh, again, right, correspondingly, you've got a little bit higher value there. Um, and, and again, if you read through McKinsey's Three Horizons model, it talks about initiatives that fall within this horizon too. It's, it's really summarized as things that will foster emerging new business, okay? And then finally, you've got horizon three, you know, sort of up at the top right, you know, the longest term, the longest, you know, sort of view out. And, you know, again, right, correspondingly, you know, the highest value, um, it's this notion again of seeding future business, right? So horizon one, you're defending and expanding current core. Horizon two, you're thinking about fostering emerging new business. And then horizon three, you're seeding future business opportunities. I would argue, you know, it wouldn't hurt for a product person in this day and age to attempt to sort of really, uh, you know, uh, overlay all of the initiatives that are going on within the organization against sort of these three horizons. And then to be able to say even, hey, look, we're just going to focus on horizon one, right? Horizon three, forget about it. We're not even going to talk about that in this day and age right now, but, you know, maybe we'll entertain, you know, conversation and planning and, 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 and thoughts and discussion around horizon two initiatives. But the things that we're going to commit to the work that we're going to do as a product and engineering group, we're, we're going to look at horizon one initiatives um, to be able to present that, to be able to articulate that again, in this current, you know, sort of situation that we all find ourselves in, I don't think it hurts. Great insights uh, coming out of that, Dennis. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah. 
Lee is asking another question. Lee is on a roll today, and he's saying it's been said that roadmaps are a statement of intention, not fact. What do you think about that? And are there ways to reinforce that with stakeholders? <laughs> um, uh, yeah. No, thank you. I'm chuckling because, um, yeah, I've 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 never heard roadmaps being uh, ever stated as as fact. <laughs> in fact, I, I, I've encouraged all of the product people that have worked for, ever worked for me, um, if you're not putting in, 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 you know, sort of a fine print underneath your roadmap, subject to change, you at least make sure everybody knows that the roadmap is a fluid document, right? It's something that's dynamic and fluid. It is not static. It is not etched in stone by any way, shape, or form. Absolutely, things are subject to change, right? Um, business objectives, company goals, customer needs, all of these things are subject to change. How on earth can you expect the roadmap to be, you know, sort of um, calcified and, and, and rigid and solid in, in, in turn? Uh, that, that just doesn't make sense. You've got to be able to, to go with the flow as the needs of the business, as your needs of your customers change and evolve as well. I think absolutely that's the case. Um, I'm wholeheartedly behind that. It's a statement of intention hey, this is, you know, sort of where we think the best road ahead is. This is how we think we're going to traverse that road based on all the things that we know. However, should the things that we know change, should new information come to light or should assumptions that we had in order to, you know, that, that led us to, to make this decision, should those assumptions turn out to be false, we will, you know, be required to pivot accordingly, right? Um, you know, you're doing your best as a product organization rhythm to really ensure, again, right, you're delivering value to the customer by way of solving their problems. You're delivering value to the business by way of the achievement of business objectives. You're making sure you're doing that all within the constraints that, you know, the technology within your work, with which you're working in uh, it provides. Um, should any of those factors change, you've got to be able to change your plans accordingly. So, uh, you know, absolutely, it's a statement of intention. Awesome. So Dennis, I think we're almost uh, at the R mark. So I'm just gonna, uh, you know, pick up a couple of questions more for you before we let yeah. you go. So sure. another questions from the uh, another question from the audience. Uh, here we have, and someone is asking about what do you think about road uh, roadmaps based on solving problems and looking uh, for opportunities versus being feature based. Oh, um, yeah, good, good question. Um, I think, I think my answer to that rhythm would be, um, twofold. Um, there's always going to be an element of delivery. There's always going to be an element of discovery in any roadmap, regardless of, uh, the timeline, right? I think we go back to sort of what I had discussed earlier. Um, you know, you could have shorter, uh, timeline roadmaps, like quarterly roadmaps that are, you know, much more tactical, much more specific, uh, perhaps much more feature based and, and feature laden say, Hey, we're going to, we're going to introduce this functionality. We're going to launch this feature, you know, within the next 90 days, um, you know, sort of the longer out, you know, sort of your 18 month roadmap could be like, Hey, you know, in Q3, we're going to look to, you know, really improve the sign up workflow, right? We're, we're, you know, Q4 is going to be about, you know, trying to solve for, um, self-serve in a more meaningful way. You know, Q1 of the following year is really going to be about, you know, sort of how do you really drive down, you know, churn and, and, and the abandonment rate in, you know, sort of in your product. Um, again, broader uh, problems to tackle. You don't have the specifics yet, right? Um, I, think, I think there's absolutely that. Um, but I think, you know, sort of also even within like, you know, sort of the, the near-term roadmaps, um, you know, the quarterlies, you've, you've got the opportunity to, um, you know, provide an even mix, right? I, I go back to sort of, you know, the analogy of, you know, a jar and, and the jar is your, your container. That's the capacity that you have and you can fill that jar with, um, rocks, pebbles, and sand and, 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 you know, sort of rocks and pebbles and sand. We talk about, um, the rocks are your, are your features, right? And then sort of, you know, the pebbles, you know, could be sort of, you know, some of the UI changes or, or the bugs that, that, that and the defects, you know, and then the sand are just, you know, sort of little, you know, really easy things, you know, even like, you know, sort of your, 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 your really easy bugs that you can fix, right? But, you know, to, to be able to just look at, you know, a jar that's got rocks only, um, 
you know, you, you know, some people will look at it and say, you've got space in between, right? Um, so, you know, this idea of, you know, and not every rock is going to be able to solve a problem or is going to be very definitive, you know, there, there could very well be discovery elements within a certain rock um, within that jar, right? So, you know, sort of that's, that, that's how I would, you know, sort of respond to that kind of question around sort of, hey, you know, what does that look like by way of, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of discovery. Awesome. And that is, I think this is the last question we have for you. Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, regarding communicating roadmaps and you've been a senior leader in product management for such a long time. What do you think is an effective way of communicating the progress of a roadmap to senior leadership? Yeah, good question. Okay. Um, Here's what I would here's what I would uh, suggest. Um, any organization, your senior leadership team, primarily wants to understand two things in a roadmap update. Um, I think the first thing they want to understand is they want to see um, you know product development efforts and the things that product and engineering are working on. Um, they want to see those things connect the broader company strategy and the vision of tomorrow to the concrete functionality deliverables that we're committing to that will continue to allow that company to win right here, right now, right today. I think, you know, a good roadmap and a good prog uh, progress update on a roadmap will allow, uh, will paint that picture for that leadership team to say, ah, yes, if we said we want to be here, if this is the broader strategy, um, you know, sort of this is, you know, sort of the things that we're doing today that will allow us to continue to win today, but to, will allow us to work towards getting to that place that we want to get to tomorrow. I think that's the first thing, you know, sort of uh, a good, you know, sort of a, a senior leadership teams want to see in a good roadmap update. I think, I think the second one um, ties very closely with that. And it's the confidence that the timely delivery of the, uh, the confidence that there's timely delivery of the functionality that addresses the key business objectives that happen to matter um, sort of within this current time period. I think, I think those are the two things, right? It's, it's this notion of can you connect, you know, sort of uh, today with tomorrow, and can you do it confidently and, and in a timely manner? Awesome! Thank you so much, Dennis, for all those amazing insights. <laughs> thank you so much, and uh, thank you for being here. And thank you everyone for joining us on Product AMA. Take care and stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Follow Product MA on Twitter and send us your topic suggestions. We look forward to seeing you soon.